So the uh, verses in our study today uh, are some of the saddest verses in the Bible. And by the way, I'm reluctant to just skip over some verses because they're, uh, they're difficult or they're sad. I think even in verses like that, we can learn from them. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's some very, very important truths in these verses we're gonna look at, but also they're sad. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But let me remind you of a very important truth. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. In Ezekiel 33, 11, God says to Ezekiel, say to them, to the nation of Israel, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's what God desires. If you watch movies and televisions, and, and I think all of us do, you know, that sometimes though, the movie or television may lead you to celebrate the death of an evil person. Now I want justice to be done, but God desires that people repent of their wickedness and not be just killed. And that should be our desire that the wicked people in this world repent of their evil. And before we were believers, we were sinners and we needed to repent of our sins. And it's, I'm so thankful God does not want to condemn you for your sin. He wants to forgive you of your sin. And we should have the same desire, brothers. Now, in a short time after Jesus spoke these words, the Jewish leaders in consort with the Roman leadership would put Jesus on a cross and kill him. Their continued rejection of their own Messiah would bring great judgment and destruction on their nation. And anyone in this world who rejects Jesus as their Messiah will face eternal destruction in a place called hell. It takes no joy, I mean, it, it, I have no joy in sharing those words, but that is the truth. And God does not want to condemn anyone to hell. Okay, so I want to speak first in this passage about Matthew 23, uh, the right concept of leadership. But before we begin with verse 8, I want to just read verses 1 through 7 so we get the proper context for what Jesus is going to, see, uh, to say. So he says in Matthew 23, verse 1, uh, it says Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all they that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do it according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them uh, with so much, so much of it as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments, they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greeting, greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. Notice that they love being called rabbi. Everything they're doing is so that people will respect them and admire them and just so people will think they're wonderful. These, these leaders of our nation are just wonderful, wonderful people. That's what they want people to think. But I suspect people know not all these people are wonderful. Okay, now we're going to pick up at verse 8, but I want you to notice, he says here, they wanted to be called rabbi. They wanted that respect, all right? So now we'll pick up at Matthew 23, 8. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. 
Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. In other words, don't be like these egotistical teachers who proudly think they speak for God. Everything they do is so they can be praised by others and so everyone will admire them. Um, now Jesus says here, uh, do not let anyone on earth call you father. Now, if my children want to call me father, that's okay. Uh, I'm, their, <laughs> I'm their father. Uh, that's okay. Children are to respect their parents, their mother and their father. But I don't want you to, I don't want you to call me father, and thank you for not doing that. Uh, it's uh, there's no need to do that. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not, you know, it's fine with me if someone calls me Pastor Ben. I, I'm, I'm the pastor here at our church. That's fine with me. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm more special than anybody else. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all accountable to the Lord. And, and so uh, I don't want you to call me father. Uh, the word uh, rabbi, it's kind of like you're, you're the, if you call someone rabbi in that day and time, it's like you're the special teacher that I'm going to follow. There were several rabbis out there, you know, so, so which teacher, which rabbi do you follow? What's important is that you follow the word of God and what it teaches and you develop that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what's important in your life and mine. It's not following some particular person. Now, uh, Paul does tell people, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, it's not wrong to listen to other leaders and to follow other leaders as long as they're following Christ. That's the essential that they're following Christ. And how do you know that if they are or not? You will have to take study into the word of God. You will have to seek to know the Lord yourself and to follow him personally and know what the word of God teaches. Now it's interesting here, uh, this word that uh, in verse 10, do not be called leaders. Now that verse is translated different ways, but a dictionary that I looked at said the word teacher here was probably used in the sense of master. And this particular word for teacher is only found in this passage in the New Testament. So I think really you could translate this word teacher here as master, or that's the idea behind it. It's, it's like you're the, you're the master, you're the teacher, you have special respect because of your position and you're so important and we all need to listen to you, you're the authority. Uh, now don't misunderstand me, I don't think it's wrong uh, to call someone, if you go to the doctor's office, to call him doctor. Now, in, my, in my view, uh, you call him doctor because he's done what's required to meet the specifications to have that position that he has at the seminary, I'm called Dr. McLean. Uh, that's because I've been through uh, years of training and received the degrees and so forth to have that title. Now, does that mean that the doctor has more authority than God or that I have more authority than God? No, no, not at all. Uh, it's a respectful title, but that doesn't make me more important than someone else. It doesn't make the medical doctor more important than someone else. Uh, it, it means we are qualified for a certain position because of our training and so forth. But that doesn't make us more important than someone else. So only God is our rabbi, master, teacher, father. You and I stand equal as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, if you think I'm doing something wrong, don't talk with someone else about it. What the scripture says, you ought to come to me privately and talk to me about it. And vice versa, if I think you're doing something wrong. That uh, doesn't mean I need to be correcting people all the time. <laughs> uh, there are times you you, uh, you have to pray, what do you, what do you, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? But my point is here, we're equal in the sight of Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Now the pastor does have a little more authority in the church because he's the pastor. And I could show you verses that support that. But the point is here that all of us stand equal before the Lord. He is our father, our master, our teacher, our rabbi. And the use of titles can lead people sometimes, I think, to think they're more important than others. Or if someone has a certain title, they're more important. Uh, for example, you've heard of certain people in history called saints. Well, <coughs> who are these people? Uh, should we pay more attention to them than, than other people? Well, I think it's fine to read what they have to say. But God's word is our authority. And in fact, the scripture, if you do want to do some study on it, you'll find that all of us who are believers in Jesus are saints. That's the way the word is used in the New Testament. Uh, so um, I'm not going to call you uh, Saint so-and-so. <laughs> I don't think that's necessary. Uh, and, and really, I think we've got to be cautious. Someone may think, well, if so-and-so is a saint, I need to listen to them and do what they say. Now, they may have good advice, but you and I as believers may not have a good advice. What's important is we go to God's word and see what God's word says. Okay, so uh, let's go on to, uh, uh, okay, first it's important to have the right concept of leadership. Leaders are not to be proud and think they're more important than others. We are to be serving others. That's what leaders are to do. And the best leaders will be the best servants. Okay, now we're going to go into the results of wrong leadership. These are uh, 20 verses that Jesus is going to confront these Pharisees and scribes with their sins. And I'm not going to read them all in one time. I plan to read these woes one at a time and not all at once. Uh, and there's eight of them. There's eight woes. And so let me begin by explaining the word woe because we don't, I mean, it's, it's not a word that we use a lot in the English language. So let me explain what it means. And part of the way I've done this is to look at how various translations will translate this word woe. And I think they're getting at the right idea by their translations, by the, by the way they translate it. The New Living Translation says, what sorrow awaits? So woe to you Pharisees, what sorrow awaits you Pharisees? I'll just read some other translations and not mention all the names of them. Another one says, you're hopeless. Another one says, how terrible for you. Another says, how horrible it will be for you. One says, a curse is on you. Another says, you are in for trouble. Another says, it will be bad for you. I think you're getting the idea here. Uh, a woe is almost the opposite of a blessing. And by the way, do you know, I'm sure in Arkansas you know this, the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Okay, a tornado watch, again, I'm sure you're aware of this, is that the conditions are favorable to a tornado. The weather conditions are favorable to a tornado. A torn tornado warning is, you may be, a certain place may be in the path of a tornado. And if you're <laughs> in the path of a tornado, you probably already know what you plan to do. Uh, if you have a safe place in your house or outside your house to go to, or maybe a neighbor go knock on the door, hey, <laughs> I'd like to visit with you a few minutes out in the tornado shelter, whatever you call it. Um, uh, yeah, or maybe you go into uh, the, the, the part of your house that does not have any windows, uh, maybe in the bathroom or if there's, if you have one and, and uh, that doesn't have any windows, kneel down and, and uh, try to 
that's what if we're if there's a tornado warning, you could be in real trouble. The tornado may be coming right to you. And that's kind of the picture here there in this passage. Jesus gives these men, these Pharisees and scribes, eight woes, and in essence, he's telling them, you are right in the path of destruction. If you don't repent, you will be destroyed. That's what he's telling them. Okay, so let's go over these uh, eight woes. And I'm just going to read the verse one at a time and then tell you the woe. And so here's the first one in verse 13. Matthew 20, 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. The poor in spirit enter the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says. This is really kind of a contrast to Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes. But the proud in the spirit these scribes and Pharisees put themselves in the place of Moses. They were the authoritative word of God to other people. But they weren't leading people to true faith in God. They were leading people astray. All right? So this is the first woe. You're leading people astray. You're shutting them off from the kingdom of heaven and you do not enter in yourselves. Here's the second woe, verse 14. Now, just a word of explanation. In some of the oldest manuscripts of the book of Matthew, or the, God, the manuscript of Matthew, the second woe is not found there. So uh, we could spend some time discussing this question, uh, but in some of the older manuscripts, it is there. I don't know why it was not you know, in some of the manuscripts, but in others. But here's the thing. I know that this woe was spoken by Jesus. And here's the reason I know. Because in Mark 12, 40, and Luke 20, verse 47, you have this woe spoken by Jesus in the same context. So I know this will was spoken by Jesus, even if some manuscripts don't have it in Matthew of Matthew's gospel. So here's the woe, uh, beginning in Matthew 23, 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So here's these, these uh, Pharisees and scribes. Their main concern is not to help people, it's to help themselves. So if they uh, take from others, they'll figure out a way to do it, while at the same time they can take from others and appear to be righteous at the same time. And again, those who do these types of things uh, are in for trouble. God wants to bless us. And in Matthew 5, 4, it says, God will comfort those. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But these scribes and Pharisees, instead of comforting people, they were causing people to mourn. Okay, let's go on to the third woe. Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So these Pharisees were seeking someone to follow them. And then they would train them. And that follower that they've trained becomes even worse than they are. And by the way, uh, I've seen this happen uh, in history. When a, when a church begins to depart from the word of God, they'll just, you know, move off a little bit on what the word of God teaches. And then before long, the people who follow them move a little further off on what the word of God teaches. And before long, 
their teaching is not from the word of God. Well, they may say God loves you, but then they redefine the word love to make it mean that God approves of your sin or something like that. And, and so these legalistic teachers were teaching their disciples, well, if it's good to become real legalistic about all these minor details, uh, it's kind of like the follower would say, I'll become even more legalistic about all these minor, minor details, and then I can be even more righteous than anyone else. All right, that's the third woe. And here's the fourth woe. It's in the beginning in verse 16. Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offer, offering. Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by both the throne of God and him who sits upon it. So the Pharisees were greedy for gain. They were blind guides. And Jesus knew the Pharisees wanted both the gold and the gifts on the altar. These leaders were not seeking the righteousness of God. They were greedy for gain. So they worked it out. They could break unimportant oaths. But we know in other passages, Jesus will say, uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, tell the truth and keep your promises. And we could spend some more time on that, but that's the fourth woe, is these, decide, these uh, scribes and Pharisees were very careful in how, what promises they made, and, and they worked things out to their advantage and their benefit for their greedy gain. Okay, let's move on to the fifth woe, verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel? So the Pharisees majored on the minors. They had rules for every small area of life, but they forgot about the most important things. Legalists can be sticklers on the details, but blind to what they really should be doing. We should show people justice, kindness, mercy, faithfulness. We should love others. Instead, they had all these rules that they followed. And as long as they followed all these rules, everything was fine. They were perfect. They were righteous. Other people were sinners, not them. That's the fifth woe. All right, let's move on to the sixth woe. Okay, this is in verses 25 and 26. And I'm also going to read the seventh woe in verses 27 and 28 because it's very similar. But here's verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. And then here's the seventh. Woe to you, verse 27, uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to them, to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So 
Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. What was most important to the Pharisees and these scribes <coughs> was not keeping the heart pure. It was keeping their appearance pleasing. It was to be sure that whenever someone looked at them, that they would say, oh, this, was a, this is a very righteous person. They are just so wonderful. Meanwhile, what they really have uh, are very, very sinful hearts. And it's a temptation for believers today to go off on the same path, to start serving God for what's best for them instead of serving God for what's best for God, doing what pleases him instead of just trying to please ourselves. So uh, what if the cup that you're about to drink out of looks clean, but it's really dirty? Do you want to drink out of it? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, these Pharisees and scribes, they just wanted to look so good on the outside, everyone would praise them. But they had sinful, sinful hearts. And the truth is, we all have sinful hearts. God wants us to turn away from that sin, put our faith in Christ as Savior, and then he, as he shows us more sin in our life, he wants us to repent of it, seek forgiveness, and not boast about how wonderful we are, but boast about how wonderful he is to forgive us of our sinfulness. Okay, we must be careful not to do what they did. Now let's go to the eighth woe in verses 29 through 33. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? So the peacemakers are God's children. The uh, persecutors are Satan's children. And what we have here is uh, it was traditional for the Pharisees to build and prove and embellish the tombs of the martyrs but it was their fathers who killed the martyrs. Not so much their biological fathers, but their spiritual fathers. In other words, those who are actually following Satan in this world will seek to persecute the true believers. They will persecute those who disagree with them. The counterfeits believe they're good because of what they do. And that's a false teaching. You're not good because of what you do. If there's any goodness in your life, it's because of what Christ has done for you. But the false religions of this world will teach you, some of them, it's good to kill those who don't believe the same as you. And, and you're serving God in the process. In these verses, Jesus tells us the right concept of leadership. The greatest leader is the greatest servant. And then he tells us the results of wrong leadership. Leaders who put themselves first are destined for hell and they lead others there too. They boast of themselves not of what God has done for them. All right, let's go move on to the rejection of right leadership. Matthew 23, 34. Behold, therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. 
Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me, until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So terrible judgment would, would come upon these leaders because they were leading people astray and they were putting themselves first in life instead of God. As a result, Jesus says in Matthew 23, 35, Upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. Now, I believe Jesus is here speaking to the nation of Israel as he speaks to these leaders. Leaders, they refuse to repent of their sins. Thankfully, many Jewish leaders and Jewish people did repent of their sins, and they put their faith in Jesus. And when the church was first constituted on the day of Pentecost and for many years <coughs> afterwards, only Jewish people were coming to faith in Christ. And then over the course of time, as you're aware, Gentiles began to come to faith in Christ. But these leaders that Jesus was talking to, the Pharisees and the Sadduc uh, Sadducees, the scribes, if they did not repent of their sins, they would be guilty of their, the sin of their spiritual ancestors in the sense that they were doing the same thing their spiritual ancestors were doing. So let me explain here. Uh, you're not guilty of someone else's sin. But if you follow them in sinfulness and do the same sins they're doing, you're guilty of the same sins they are. Here's the way a, a writer put it. Uh, the nation is guilty your fathers were guilty. You have shown yourselves to be like them. God did not hold them guilty for what their fathers had done, but judgments descend on children in consequence of the wickedness of parents. In other words, if your parents are alcoholics, do you think it's more likely you're gonna become an alcoholic as a child? Yes, yes, it's more likely. Thankfully, if parents take their children to church, it's more likely when those children grow up that they will go to church. So I think that's what uh, our Lord is speaking about here. Um, and then he mentions from uh, uh, Abel as the first person who was murdered in the Old Testament. You can study that in Genesis 4. And then he mentions Zechariah the prophet who lived much later. In Zechariah 1.1 1, 1 it says, Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. Now I think that's who Jesus is referencing, but we don't know for sure how Zechariah the prophet died. But I think Jesus knew, and I think there's some hint from some of the rabbinic writings of how Zechariah died. And, and there are other uh, possibilities of who Zechariah is, but that's, that's not the point. In, in other words, if we don't know exactly how Zechariah died or exactly who this Zechariah was, that's not so important. But what's important here is to understand there is a result if you as a nation continue to murder people who are innocent, there will be a judgment come upon you as a nation. And Jesus says all these things will come upon this generation and in AD 70 great destruction would fall on Jerusalem. You've heard about this before. The Romans would come in. There would be mass murder of the Jews. The temple would be destroyed. It would be devastating. And look at verse uh, 23 verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are not sent to, or pardon me, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together 
the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus was willing to forgive them. They were not willing to receive his forgiveness. That's what he says in verse 37. Never think for a moment that God is responsible for people choosing against him. He desires people to come to faith in Christ. He desires all people, no matter how evil they are, to repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ. That's what he desires. Imagine you're walking down the street one night. You see a house on fire. You see some smoke coming out of the window of the house. You don't know who lives there. Would you just keep on walking? I hope not. you'd knock on the door, try to see if anyone's awake in the house, call a 911, try to get some help there, what's going on? And, and people may look out the window and say, I don't know this person I'm knocking on my door. Well, how, can I trust them? What are you going to do, just walk away or you want to keep knocking to let them know they're in danger? Jesus was willing to tell his enemies, the truth is, destruction is coming your way and you will spend an eternity in hell if you don't repent of your sins. We as believers need to be willing to tell others about the Lord Jesus and his love for them as God leads Knock on the doors, maybe. I don't want to wait till somebody's house is on fire to tell them about Jesus. I'll tell you this, and then we'll close. The uh, couple of houses away from us has been on sale. I think it was on rent for a while. And no one rented it, and they just put it up for sale. The other day, uh, a couple of days ago, I saw a gentleman. He backed up his truck into the driveway, and he got out and was moving some things in. And I came out and was doing something in my car. So he saw me, he walked over to me and I started walking over to him. He said, I wanted to meet you. He said, I'm a new neighbor in your neighborhood. I said, good, good to meet you. We talked for a few minutes and, um, and I said, uh, now I'm a Christian. I hope you don't mind if I ask you this, but are you a believer in Christ? He said, well, I used to go to church when I was a kid but I hadn't been to church in years. And we talked a little bit, and it was kind of clear to me he didn't want to talk much about it. <laughs> and uh, so I offered to help him. I, had, I said, I've got a, a dollar, you know, two-wheeler in my uh, garage. If you, want to, if you want to, I'll come help you. He said, no, I'm about through. I said, well, if you ever want to talk about Jesus, I would love to talk to you. And, uh, and he was nice. But he didn't have much interest in talking about the Lord. So I'd ask you to pray for him. That God might help him to see his need for the Lord. And I saw him a few days later. Uh, he was uh, moving some more things in and I offered to help him again. Uh, you know, there's different ways we can seek to help people to come to know the Lord. And I hope that you will do that. And, it's, <laughs> and that's what God wants all of us to do. And, uh, and it saddens me to think of how many people are turning away from the Lord, are refusing to believe in his word, and are heading for destruction. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you that I have come to faith in you. You've given me the gift of salvation. I didn't deserve it. I'm so thankful that you offered it and, and that I 
not received it. And I pray for anyone listening that has not received your gift of salvation. They would receive it and realize you love them. And help us as we go out to share with others. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?